52 weeks ago, 65 teams were selected and seeded. Once the brackets were filled, the madness began. Iowa State pushing, time running down, Tinsley off the to the rim, upstairs, knocked away, it's over. Forget about Cinderella. Gonzaga once again has proven they are legit. And the Pitt State Nittany Lions are heading to the Sweet 16. The Maryland Dolphins, after a hundred years of basketball, will head to the Final Four for the first time. Hands up, Levy for three. Today, we start anew. 65 teams are about to march down the road to the Final Four, sharing gladness, sadness, and without a doubt, madness. CBA Sports NCAA Basketball Championship Selection Show is presented by United Airlines. We are United. So many great moments, so many more to come. Hi again, everyone. I'm Greg Gumbel. Welcome to our New York studios and to the NCAA Basketball Championship Selection Show. Tonight, we begin CBS Sports' 21st year covering March Madness. And once again, from first round tip to trophy, this is your home for all the emotion and the drama that is the NCAA Basketball Tournament. My number one seed, or some of you may call him the pod, along the road to the final <laughs> four is Clark Kellogg, the happy Buckeye. Are you ready and rearing to go? I am ready to get rid of all these books and RPIs and let's unveil his field, <laughs> Greg. As a matter of fact, I should throw this stuff off the table all after right. the show. Also joining us this evening, Jim Nance and Billy Packer, who are in Indianapolis, where they've just wrapped up their courtside duties at the Big Ten Championship. So now, we begin the proceedings with a look at the number one seeds beginning in the East. And the number one seed in the East, the Maryland Terrapins. The Terrapins under Gary Williams. They've never been a number one seed. This is the first time for the Terps. The top seed in the Midwest, the Kansas Jayhawks. Kansas the sixth time as a number one seed, their fifth time under coach Roy Williams. In the South, Duke's Blue Devils. Their fifth straight, and that's a tournament record, as a number one seed. And out west, the number one seed, the Cincinnati Bearcats. Coached by Bob Huggins, this is another club that have never been a number one seed. And none of this is a surprise, Clark, as far as Maryland and Duke and Kansas is concerned. What about Cincinnati as the number one? Well, I'm anxious to hear what the committee's rationale was behind Cincinnati getting the number one seed. Because Oklahoma did win the Big 12 Conference Tournament Championship, it seems as though that may have already been decided um, prior to the end of that game. All right, so this is how the final four will shape up this year. On the 30th of March in Atlanta, Georgia, the East winners, will play the Midwest champions in one national semifinal, while the South and the West will meet in the other. And then the national championship game will be contested on Monday night, April the 1st, also, of course, in Atlanta, Georgia. By the way, CBS will telecast the final four in HD TV. Bonnie Bernstein has been stationed at the NCAA Hall of Champions in Indianapolis throughout Selection Weekend. She joins us now with more on the brackets and changes in the tournament set up this year. Bonnie. Hi, Greg, and welcome to the NCAA's Hall of Champions here in Indianapolis. We are just moments away from the big announcement teams have been awaiting all weekend, the unveiling of the brackets for the 2002 NCAA Men's Basketball Tournament. And keep in mind, the field of 65 will be comprised of 31 conference and tournament champions and 34 at-large teams, with that opening round to be played this Tuesday in Dayton. Here are your eight first and second round sites for the tournament. Now remember, the committee's goal this year is to really try to keep the top seeds as close to home as possible. In a nutshell, that means, say you are out in the West region, but you're an East Coast school, the committee will try as best as it can to place you in an Eastern city for those early rounds. 
Now here's where the top two seeds in each region were sent last year for the first and second rounds. And you'll notice there are five teams that didn't play anywhere near their geographic regions, among them Michigan State and Arizona. But if you take those same teams and place them geographically based on this new system, one seeds Michigan State in the south and Illinois in the midwest would both be playing in Dayton, Ohio, because that's the site closest to their campuses. So what do the coaches think? I don't see pluses or minuses right now. I want to see it. I want to see it in action and then evaluate it. They've got to look at attendance and see how can we continue to have and produce the best product. I think that there's a lot of questions about it. I, I don't think that anybody really has a real good feel for it right now. I think it's good that we're at least attempting to look at something a little bit different. I think in the East we probably have just on pure numbers more teams so it makes it a little more difficult. I guess I'm one of those guys, if it's not you know, broke, don't try to fix it. What makes the NCAA tournament is the fairness, the neutral courts, the fact that you're, you have a chance for upsets. And if you eliminate or cut back severely those chances for upsets, uh, I think there's going to be a problem. Well, we've been to the NCAA eight straight years, and I think we've been west six times. Um, there's good parts of that. Uh, you, you know, you get the team isolated a little bit. Uh, and the ticket situation is, isn't as bad as if you play home. However, the parents of the players really struggle to get to the game sometimes. If this works out, it's a great decision. You know, and I guess you're the skeptical person sort of wants to sit back and wait and see. But if this works out, where you do have the gymnasiums, I'm old school talking gyms, if you do have the gyms full, that is much better to say the least. The kids enjoy it more, the excitement level is higher, the noise level is higher, all those things I think are a positive. And, and I guess I just want to sit back and, and wait and see when the pairings come out and where, and then, you know, because I, I do think it could be a great positive. Of course, like anything, with change comes concern. Will playing close to home give some teams a hometown advantage? And if so, as Jim Beheim was just talking about, does it eliminate the chance we'll see some of those great upsets by the lower seeds that give the tournament so much flavor every year? Or say you are advanced from a Friday-Sunday bracket to a regional where they play Thursday-Saturday, are you at a disadvantage because you have one less day of preparation? Obviously, a lot of questions and concerns, Greg, that won't be addressed until we see how everything shakes out after the tournament. All right, Bonnie, thank you. And a lot of teams and their fans have gathered around the country eagerly awaiting word as to where they'll be playing and, in some cases, if they'll be playing in the 2002 NCAA tournament. Coming up, we will reveal the East bracket when the selection show continues on CBS right after this. We welcome you back to our New York studios. Are you ready? Yeah, let's roll. All right, let's go. Here are the East brackets. We'll begin at the very top with the top seeded Maryland Terrapins. Under Gary Williams, the Terps 26 and 4, the ACC regular season champions. They will play the winner of the opening round game between Alcorn State, the regular season in Southwestern Conference tournament champions and Siena. Siena at 16 and 18, but the Metro Atlantic Athletic Conference tournament champions. The eighth seed in the East is Wisconsin, one of the Big Ten's four co-champions during the season against number nine seed St. John's. The Red Storm under Mike Jarvis, who joins Louis Carnesecca as the only coach to take St. John's to two straight NCAA's jubilation in Jamaica, New York. St. John's on its way. Continuing. In the East, the number five seed, the Golden Eagles of Marquette, 26 and 6 on the year, their first NCAA tournament since 1997, and the Golden Hurricane of Tulsa. They will play on Thursday in St. Louis, Missouri. John Phillips takes the Golden Hurricane to the tournament in his first year. The number four seed in the East is Kentucky. The Wildcats at 20 and 9. It's 44th tournament. It's 11th in a row. They'll take on the 13th seed, Crusaders of Valparaiso. That is also a Thursday night game in St. Louis. The number two seed, as we move now to the bottom half of the East, the Huskies of Yukon, 1999 national champions, 24 and 6 coming off of the double overtime win last night against Hampton. The Pirates at 26 and 6. That will be a Friday game in Washington, D.C. The number seven seed in the East, the Wolfpack of North Carolina State. Their first trip to the tournament since 1991. They will take on the number 10 seed Spartans of Michigan State. That is a Washington game on Friday. 
Tom Izzo's team 16 and 3 in the tournament. The number three seed in the East, the Georgia Bulldogs at 21 and 9. Jim Herrick takes his fourth different program to the tournament, one of three coaches to do that, and they'll meet the 14th seed Pacers of Murray State. Murray State, the Ohio Valley Conference Tournament Champions, that's in Chicago on Friday. And to round out the East, number six seed, Texas Tech. Bob Knight took a team that went 9-19 and last year. They come in at 23-8, and and they will face the Salukis of Southern Illinois University. They were concerned no longer. They finished the, se the season 26 and 7, and there is happiness in Carbondale, Illinois. The Salukis round out the East region. So as we take a look at the East region, what do you see, Clark? Well, one of the things that jumped out at me was Georgia getting the number three seed. I didn't have them quite that high in terms of the seed line. And then also, as we're prone to do, is looking ahead um, to possibly a Maryland and Connecticut um, regional, if that were to occur. And then the game that kind of strikes my fancy is that Kentucky Valparaiso matchup. Kentucky has been a little up and down this year. Valparaiso is a very experienced team with a lot of international flavor, size, and shooting. Um, I've got that one um, bullet pointed on my um, on All my right, bracket. as we move to the lower half, take a look. Well, again, Georgia being a number three seed, I just didn't know that they would, I didn't feel as though they would be worthy of that highest seed. I thought maybe more on the four or five line. And we visited with Jim Calhoun earlier today, and he's got to be pretty pleased to see that his Huskies are, are on that two line in the East. And how about if UConn advances to play Michigan State, UConn, the 1999 champion, Michigan State the champion in the year 2000. So that's a look at the East right now. Coming up next, the Midwest and the South brackets when we continue from New York in just a moment. Hey, on an all-new Late Show, Dave welcomes Everybody Loves Raymond's Ray Romano plus NBA superstar Jason Kidd. It's all-new Dave, Monday. Yeah! Welcome back to the NCAA Basketball Championship Selection Show. And now here's how the committee sorted things out in the Midwest. As we have already told you, the top seed in the Midwest, the Jayhawks of Kansas, coached by Roy Williams, finished the season at 29-3. and And they will take on the Crusaders of Holy Cross, the 16th seed. That will be a Thursday night game in St. Louis, Missouri. The Crusaders won the Patriot League tournament. The number eight seed in the Midwest, the Stanford Cardinal at 19 and nine. They make their eighth straight trip to the tournament and they'll face the ninth seed in the Midwest, the Hilltoppers of Western Kentucky, who won the Sunbelt Conference Tournament. Yeah, that's you guys in Bowling Green, Kentucky. They're looking forward to the Stanford Cardinal. The number five seed in the Midwest, Billy Donovan's Florida Gators, making its fourth straight NCAA trip for the first time in school history. They've gone four in a row, and they'll meet the number 12 seed Blue Jays of Creighton University, who won the Missouri Valley Conference Tournament Championship. The Blue Jays, 22 and eight. That will be a Friday game in Chicago. The number four seed in the Midwest, the Fighting Illini of Illinois, one of four teams that tied for the Big Ten regular season championship, coached by Bill Self. And they'll meet the 13th seed Aztecs of San Diego State, winners of the Mountain West Conference Tournament. That's a Friday game in Chicago. Also in the Midwest, as we move on down now to the lower half, the number two seed, the Ducks of Oregon. 23 and eight, winners of the Pac-10 regular season title for the first time in 57 years. And they will take on the 15th seed Grizzlies of Montana, winners of the Big Sky Conference Tournament. And are they pleased in Oregon? Some happy campers in Eugene. As we continue in the Midwest, the seventh seed, the Demon Deacons of Wake Forest, coached by Skip Prosser, a 20 and 12 year. Wake's ninth NCAA appearance in the last 11 years. They'll meet the 10th seed, the Waves of Pepperdine, tied with Gonzaga as the West Coast Conference regular season champion. And they are happy in Malibu as well. That is a Thursday game in Sacramento. So the number three seed in the Midwest now. You saw them earlier today here on CBS, Mississippi State's Bulldogs. 26 and seven on the year. They'll meet the number 14 seed in the West, the Cowboys of McNeese State, winners of the Southland Conference regular season and tournament champion. That's a Friday game in Dallas, Texas. And the number six seed in the Midwest, the Longhorns of Texas. 
Rick Barnes with his 20 and 11 team will take on the number 11 seed in the Midwest. That's the Eagles of Boston College making their 13th NCAA tournament appearance and that is also a Friday game in Dallas. So that's a look at the Midwest and with that let's go out to Indianapolis and join Jim Nance and Billy Packer guys. All right. Thank you Greg. Billy let's begin on the top half of that bracket in the Midwest with Kansas the one seed and a very interesting and uh, compelling 8-9 game between Stanford, Western Kentucky. A couple of premier big guys will battle in that one. Borchard, Marcus. Yeah, we had um, Chris Marcus uh, in, in the last last year playing against Florida. An outstanding player, and I think that Western Kentucky played so well without him this year that they'll give Stanford everything they can handle. And um, just looking ahead a little bit, uh, if, if Kansas gets by Holy Cross, what about a Kansas-Stanford or Kansas-Western Kentucky matchup? That size against the Jayhawks, because they both have size there, Stanford and Western Kentucky. Well, Jim, everybody knew Kansas was going to be a number one, but with that loss today at Oklahoma, does it take some of the luster off this team mentally? Because I really felt the way they played against Bob Knight's team just yesterday, that it may have separated itself from the field, but that's obviously not going to be their state of mind coming in. You see Florida, Creighton, and Illinois, San Diego State, a possible Illinois-Florida second round matchup. They had a matchup uh, two years ago in, in, the, in the second round. Well, how about Steve Fisher coming back to the Big Ten? Yep. <laughs> he knows those teams. Are, he ought to know those the teams well. at Illinois very, very well. Let's look at the bottom half of the Midwest bracket. And, uh, Billy, let's talk about the two seed. How about that celebration out in Eugene? It looked like it was a full house for another game other than just watching the selection. So uh, a tremendous year. They did not lose in that arena. So I guess the fans uh, just love to be in that, in that environment. But uh, the, something jumps out at me right here. Uh, a Wake Forest team that last year came to the NCAA tournament with a lot of hope and was blown away by Butler going up against a team that has destroyed some high-ranked clubs this year in Pepperdine. All right, Mississippi State's the three against McNeese State in Texas against Boston College, B.C. Some were wondering, would they make it in? They got in. Well, B.C. guards, and you can tell that they got in maybe by a hair, Jim. That has to be one of the last teams that made it in that large situation. Great guard play at Texas going against great guard play at Boston College. That's an interesting matchup, both at 20 and 11. All right, Billy, let's send it back for now to Greg in New York. Greg? All right, Jim, Billy, thanks very much. So let's take a look now as we, we've already taken a look at the first half of our brackets. The winners of those two regions will play each other in one of the national semifinals. Now our first look at the South. As we have already told you, the top seed in the South, Coach K's Duke Blue Devils. Mike Krzyzewski has won three NCAA titles at Duke. Duke makes its 26th tournament appearance. So the number one seed in the South is Duke at 28 and three. And we have the South number one seed Duke. There they are. And what they'll do is they'll take on the number 16 seed in the South. And those are the Eagles of Winthrop at 19 and 11. That is a Thursday game in Greenville, South Carolina. Winthrop, winner of the Big South Conference Championship. The number eight seed is Notre Dame, the Fighting Irish at 21 and 10, making consecutive NCAA tournament appearances for the first time since 89-90. They'll take on the 49ers of Charlotte. Bobby Lutz's Niners, their fifth NCAA bid in six years. That's also a Thursday game in Greenville. The number five seed in the South, the Indiana Hoosiers. Indiana's 17th straight trip to the NCAA tournament. And they'll take on the 12th seeded Utes of Utah, coached by Rick Majerus. That's a Thursday game in Sacramento, California. The number four seed in the South, the Trojans of Southern California. USC advanced to the Elite Eight last year. They're 22 and 9 this year. And they'll take on the 13th seed Seahawks of UNC Wilmington. And that's a Thursday game in Sacramento. Now, all the way to the bottom now, the South region brackets, the number two seed. The Crimson Tide of Alabama. They make it their first NCAA tournament appearance since 1995, 26 and 7 on the year. They'll meet the number 15th seed Owls of Florida Atlantic. Their first trip to the NCAA tournament Thursday in Greenville. The number seven seed, Cowboys of Oklahoma State at 23 and 8. Eddie Sutton, one of three coaches to lead four programs to the NCAA tournament. They'll meet the number 10 seed, Kent State Golden Flashes. Kent State on a 17 game winning streak. And are they pleased in Kent, Ohio? You bet they are. That's a Thursday game in Greenville. Let's finish out the South region now. 
Third seed in the South is Pittsburgh. The Panthers earn an NCAA tournament berth for the first time since 1993 with a 27 and 5 record and they will meet the 14th seed Blue Devils of Central Connecticut State 27 and 4. They won the Northeast regular season and tournament. That's a Pittsburgh game on Friday. The number six seed in the South, the Golden Bears of California. The Bears make consecutive tournament appearances for just the second time in more than 40 years. They'll meet the number 11 seed Quakers of Penn at 25 and 6. That is a Friday game in Pittsburgh and in Philadelphia. The Quakers celebrate. The Ivy League champions are going to the tournament. So as we take an overview of the South region, what do you see, Clark? Well, I looked at that Cal-Penn matchup. Penn was a team that many thought would have enough on their resume to make it as an at-large had they not qualified by winning the Ivy League championship. I think that's an intriguing matchup, and we always tend to try to look ahead. What about a possible rematch of an Elite Eight game that took place last year between Duke and USC? As we look at the bottom half, how about the possible second round matchup? And this could be just a regional matchup between Penn and Pittsburgh. Exactly. That would be an interesting one. Both really having solid years. And then Kent State, a team that's won. They don't want you to slide them, Greg. I think they got one more win on that win streak, 18 after last night. But um, they're a team that's played extremely well of late. And Oklahoma State, on the other hand, has struggled just a little bit um, coming down the stretch. Let me ask you about a possible Oklahoma State-Alabama matchup. Oklahoma State reached the Final Four in 95. They beat Alabama in the second round that year. As always, the bracket provides possibilities that could be endless. Exactly, and we tend to try to explore all of them, and the one great thing about this tournament is that it'll all be decided on the sidelines, between the lines, and we don't know where the stories and drama is really going to unfold. Okay, a reminder for you folks, following the selection show, you can get a complete NCAA tournament coverage, including printable brackets and scouting reports on all 65 teams, only at cbs.sportsline.com. America Online users enter the keyword CBS sports line just one bracket remains and that's the West Gonzaga well we'll be headed out there but who will be playing in the first round we'll find out right after this message and a word from your local station that was fun this morning was it There's a live look at the Big Ten Tournament champion, Ohio State Buckeyes. They know they're headed west. They just don't know who the opponent is right now. So let's bring it to you. The breakdown in the West region. We've already told you the top seed in the West, the Cincinnati Bearcats, coached by Bob Huggins at 30 and 3, coming off the Conference USA Tournament Championship. They'll take on the 16th seed Terriers of Boston University. That is a Friday game in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Boston University, the America East Conference Tournament winner. The number eight seed, the Bruins of UCLA at 19 and 11. UCLA's 38th trip to the tournament. They'll meet the number nine seed, Rebels of Ole Miss at 20 and 10. Coach Rod Barnes, the first to lead the Rebels to three NCAA tournaments. That's a Friday game in Pittsburgh as well. The number five seed in the West, the Hurricanes of Miami, coached by Perry Clark. Miami makes its fourth trip to the tournament in the last five years. They will meet the number 12 seed, Tigers of Missouri, coached by Quinn Snyder. That is a Thursday game in Albuquerque, New Mexico. The number four seed in the West, there are the Ohio State Buckeyes, coached by Jim O'Brien. And who will they play? The 13th seed, Wildcats of Davidson, the Southern Conference Tournament Championship. And I'd say the Buckeyes are extremely pleased about what they've done today and where they're headed in the tournament. So continuing in the West now, the number two seed out West. Today's winner of the Big 12 tournament, Oklahoma. The Sooners, coached by Kelvin Sampson, make their eighth straight tournament appearance. They will meet the 15th seed, Illinois Chicago Flames, at 20 and 13. That's a Friday game in Dallas, Texas. The number seven seed in the West, the Musketeers of Xavier. Xavier won the Atlantic 10 Conference Tournament 25 and 5. They'll meet the 10th seed Warriors of Hawaii. Hawaii at 27 and 5. That's a Friday game in Dallas. The number three seed out west, the Wildcats of Arizona. A Final Four team last season, winner of the Pac-10 Tournament. And they'll play the 14th seed in the west, Santa Barbara's Gauchos. That's a Thursday game in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And the last pairing, the number six seed, the Bulldogs of Gonzaga the West Coast Conference Tournament Champion, and they'll face the number 11 seed Cowboys of Wyoming. That's a Thursday game in Albuquerque and at Gonzaga. Coach Mark Few and 
The rest of the crew may be a little bit upset about the seating and the location. We will see. Meanwhile, let's take you back out to Jim and Billy in Indianapolis. Guys. All right, Greg, I think we just found the most motivated team in the tournament. Gonzaga feels snubbed at a six, and they should feel I, that. I think so, too, Jim. And, and you can tell by the reaction right there. That club was looking at maybe a three seed and a, a drop all the way back to a six. They did everything that was asked of them this year. Yeah, they're saying, we've got to show them again. We're Cinderella again. This year, we prove we belong with the, with the Giants. Let's go back through the West. You say the West is the most difficult is the of best. the four. The West is the best. Cincinnati against Boston University. The Bearcats could be looking at in the second game. UCLA or Ole Miss. You've seen UCLA knock off Kansas this year when it was number one. Saw them win at Stanford. I mean, that's a UCLA team that could really go all the way to the Final Four. What do you expect here? Jim, when they're playing their, the be their best, they're a one or two seed. When they're playing their worst, they're, they're somewhere on a, on a 12 or 13 seed, so they're right where they ought to be at an eight and nine. A very difficult assignment in Ole Miss, but but UCLA is the kind of team, as we have seen, playing against the likes of Kansas that can beat anybody in the country when they're rolling. Obviously, Missouri, one of the last teams in, and at large, 12 seed going against Miami. And Ohio State also, I think, has reason to perhaps complain here. They win the Big Ten championship, and they don't get any kind of regional preference. They go all the way to Albuquerque. And at the bottom of the bracket, Billy, Oklahoma wins today against Kansas, but just stays on the two line. Well, you know, I thought that uh, if they were to win that game, it would jump up to a number one. But what it does do, Conference USA champion, uh, Big 12 champion, Pac-10 champion, and Big 10 champion all in the same bracket. Hawaii against Xavier. Any thoughts on that one? Really have no call on that other than Hawaii uh, has played extremely well, even when they came mainland in the past. Arizona against uh, Santa Barbara, and again, Gonzaga as a six. I think most had forecast for Gonzaga to be maybe like a three a, seed. A three or a four at the yeah. least. All right, Billy, let's go through the uh, Sweet 16 seeds now, the top four seeds in each region. This is how you usually determine the difficulty. You try to figure out which one's the hardest, and you say the West is the best, and which one would be well, second? Well, they have two number one seeds, in my opinion, right there. And then I'd, I'd jump over to the East, Maryland, Connecticut. Anybody who saw that game last night, one of the great Big Ten champions, uh, Big East championships I've ever seen. Georgia, a team that beat Florida twice this year in Kentucky. I think the East would come in second. All right, and Duke over there in the South is a one with Alabama, Pittsburgh, and USC. It, what, what stands out here? What does not look like it's in sync with your 16? Well, I'll tell you one thing right now, the Duke-USC matchup, we had that last year in an Eastern Regional Final. And that could be meeting in the Sweet 16 round. The Georgia thing, Clark pointed it out earlier. Uh, that might be a it, little higher than most had figured. Well, yeah, I would say Georgia a little higher, Gonzaga a, a, a lot lower than what we had anticipated. There had been so much talk, Billy, about trying to find that fourth number one seed. Duke, Maryland, and Kansas were certainly certainly locks, but Cincinnati with the way it played in its tournament and Oklahoma with its play through the Big 12, again, bolsters that West bracket. Well, you can see that the committee stayed pretty consistent. They felt that the last game of a conference tournament didn't necessarily make any difference between another top game throughout the course of the year, and that may be the case for an Ohio State at four and an Oklahoma at two. Billy, always so much talk about the top six conferences. They take 33 spots in the tournament, led by the Big East, Big 12, Pac-10, SEC, all with with six each. The ACC top heavy and ends up with just four. Bubbles burst here in the last few minutes. A group like Utah State and Butler right here in Indianapolis. Yeah, Butler really has to be hurting. They did everything that was called upon for them. And, and I, I think when you, you think about Ball State, and we go back to the beginning of the year, back-to-back -back wins when they were so strong out in Hawaii, uh, beating uh, Kansas and UCLA, back-to-back -back nights and giving Duke a good game. But here we are in March, and everything changes. Uh, Virginia at 17 and 11, you felt they would be left out. Well, I really did, but uh, I would like to know what would have happened had they won that Michigan State game that was canceled on the ice, and they got no credit for that whatsoever in their in their win column, assuming that they would have gone on to win that. But they played so poorly down the stretch that you can't blame the committee for that one. All right, Billy, and finally, last teams in at larges with the worst seeds. It's where you figure out the ones that were really riding that bubble all weekend. Missouri, Tulsa, Utah, Boston College, Southern Illinois, and Wyoming. Well, Missouri with a good showing probably got them in the good showing even though they lost against Kansas. That was very impressive. Rick Majerus' team there at a 12, I think would be a very dangerous 12 seed. Boston College, you always love teams with good backcourts uh, in the NCAA tournament and, uh, and that would spell well for them. All right, Billy, the field is set and Greg, 
I think the, my partner here has a few questions here in a few minutes. Let's send it back to you in New York. I think we have a bunch of questions, Jim, <laughs> Billy. Thank you much. Up next, a little insight on the selection committee's thought processes. We talk with the committee's chair, Lee Fowler. We will also get reactions from coaches Roy Williams of Kansas, Gary Williams of Maryland, Bob Huggins of Cincinnati, each awarded a number one seed when we continue in just a moment. Welcome back to our studios in New York, and now let's introduce the chair of the NCAA Division I men's basketball as we continue the road to the Final Four.